Are you ready to change your life, but don't know how to start? Is your stress and worries keeping you awake at night? Have you been battling grief, anxiety, or depression all alone? Have you lost touch with your own sense of being or spirituality? Soul Free Therapies offers professional and affordable live video streaming counseling and coaching services from the comfort of your own home. Sessions offered in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Go to our website at www.soul-free.com and book your first session today. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. And you call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opperman Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to send a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I have dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, 7 days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be because the team at kmdlaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to kmdlaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMD-LAW. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact kmdlaw. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman. I'm really excited about today's guest. We have Charles Gardner. He's a former municipal court judge and uh, spent his life working in the New York City, uh, New York State Department of Corrections. He's written a book called Danamora, Two Escaped Killers, Three Weeks of Terror, and the Largest Manhunt Ever in New York State. Uh, Mr. Gardner, are you there? I am, sir. Hi, Ed. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And this is a, a fascinating book. I even watched the uh, Showtime uh, series. I can't believe it was 2015. What the hell? Time flies, huh? 
I guess, huh? Yeah, it, it seems like it was just yesterday, but um, yes, this uh, the event that we're talking about in the book, Denimora, did take place in early June of 2015, correct. So tell us about yourself. Who is Charles A. Gardner? Well, prior to me taking the bench um, in upstate Malone, uh, Malone, New York, up in Franklin County, I retired as what was known as a regional training lieutenant with the New York State Department of Corrections. As a regional training lieutenant with the Department of Corrections, basically I oversaw the training of approximately a little better than 5,000 people. Uh, that worked for the New York State Department of Corrections in the northern uh, correctional facilities located in northern New York. Uh, there was 13 facilities that I was the liaison between those facilities, uh, their administrators, and the New York State Albany Training Academy. Um, I succeeded uh, to have a unblemished 25-year career with the New York State Department of Corrections, as well as I've been a lifelong resident uh, in northern New York, up in uh, the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. Yeah, I used to go up there to Seven uh, Seven Lake. No, is it Twelfth Lake? It's up there, or Seventh Lake? Oh, you yeah. We actually, there's a bunch of them up in there, mm-hmm. uh, right up in that uh, Tupper Lake region. Uh, yes, there's a there's a ton of, and uh, I'm sorry, but there's actually over a thousand different lakes in there. But they have that area where you're talking about where they actually name them like that. Right, right. Yeah, I remember. I was driving around up there in the dark, and he says, yeah, when you see the duck, <laughs> when you see there's a sign yeah. of a duck on a tree, make a right. That's the road. Don't miss it. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. It's your sign right there. It's Perfect. Different, yeah. different world. Different uh, world. So, okay, so what happened up there at Danamore? Why don't you describe the prison first? What, Danim- what is Danamore prison like? Well, okay, so in the town of Danamore, upstate New York, uh, it's situated a uh, New York State's largest maximum security prison for uh, male inmates. It's uh, 15 miles as a crow flies from the state line for Vermont, and it's approximately 25 miles as a crow flies to the Canadian border. Uh, Clinton Correctional Facility, located in Denimore, New York, houses some of New York State's most ruthless killers, child molesters, rapists, murderers, serial killers, and the list goes on. And basically, um, early June of 2015, during the early morning count of the inmate population, Clinton Correctional came up too short. There were two inmates missing on in the morning count. Yeah, and why don't you describe the two inmates there, uh, Sweet and uh, his buddy? Okay, so you've got David Sweat. David Sweat's the younger of the two, born in June of 80. Um, Multiple encounters with law enforcement through his entire life. What sent him to Clinton Correctional was during the early mornings of July 4th, 2002, David Sweat, his cousin, as well as another co-defendant, went to Great Bend, Pennsylvania, just across the New York State border, They stole a pickup truck, ultimately utilizing that pickup truck in the uh, smash and grab, uh, backing the pickup truck into the uh, front entrance of a gun store where they removed a tremendous amount of firepower, and then they returned back to New York State while they were moving the stolen weapons from the stolen vehicle into David Sweat's personal vehicle. They observed an incoming deputy sheriff vehicle. They took hiding. Uh, The deputy sheriff pulled into the parking lot, exited his vehicle. He was ambushed by David Sweat. The deputy sheriff was hit some 15 times. 15 rounds were fired from David Sweat towards the deputy sheriff. One round actually sneaking up underneath the deputy's vest, striking a deputy in the belly, knocking the deputy to the ground. At that point in time, David Sweat took his personal vehicle, ran over the deputy, striking the deputy, dragging the deputy underneath the vehicle across the asphalt parking lot until the deputy finally emerged out from underneath the vehicle as the vehicle progressed across the parking lot. At this point in time, the deputy had lost control of his personal handgun. 
At that point in time, one of David Sweat's co-defendants had approached the deputy, utilizing the deputy's own handgun, and assassinated the deputy with two rounds to the deputy's skull. That's how David Sweat ended up at Clinton Correctional. Hey, real quick, do we know how this deputy showed up on the scene? Was it happenstance, just driving by, or was there a call? Just just happened to be in the wrong place, unfortunately, at the wrong time. And he had come across these vehicles sitting in this little park, and he, he pulled in to kind of check out what was going on. Now, the criminal history with Richard Matt, again, he's been on the radar of law enforcement since his early days. Um, he's done a couple of state bids, so he's been incarcerated a, a couple of different times. Um, and his claim to fame was that he was given a, another opportunity by an old timer that owned a, um, uh, like a meat shop. And uh, the old timer's name was William Rickerson. And Richard Matt was stealing from Mr. Rickerson. Mr. Rickerson got wind of it. Finally, just had cut bait with Richard Matt. Said, "Listen, I, I gave you an opportunity. You've uh, you've been incarcerated a couple of times. I tried to show you a little faith. Tried to show you a little bit of you know, give you a help and hand up. And and you're going to steal from me." Well, Matt wasn't satisfied. He felt that uh, William Rickerson owed him something. So early December of um, '97, um, Matt went to Mr. Rickerson's residence, kidnapped Mr. Rickerson, brought him across two different state lines, leaving the state of New York and bringing him across in, in and out of two other states, um, continuously torturing, beating, assaulting the old timer. Long story short, they end up returning back to New York State after a 27-hour cross-country journey. As a uh, after they had re-entered New York State, Richard Matt snapped William Rickardson's neck, utilizing just his bare hands, thus killing the old timer in December of '97. Total take between Richard Matt and his co-defendant was approximately eighty dollars. A couple of credit cards. And old, old man Rickerson's wife's, uh, deceased wife's wedding uh, ring. Mm. Um, Matt fled the area, ran to Mexico. Long story short, he wasn't in Mexico very long before he ended up killing a U.S. businessman that he had just haphazardly come across at a bar. Uh, the U.S. businessman had made the mistake of flashing a roll of cash in front of Richard Matt. Matt followed him into the men's room where he assaulted him with a knife repeatedly, thus killing the U.S. businessman. Matt would be found guilty in a Mexican court, incarcerated in Mexico, and then approximately eight, nine years into a sentence would be sent back to the States to face charges for the murder of Mr. Rickerson. And that's how he ended up at Clinton Correctional in Denimar. Oh, boy. Well, I guess the third uh, uh, player in all this is uh, Tilly. Uh, what's her story? So Joyce Mitchell uh, was a civilian employee. Uh, she followed her husband, who was also a civilian employee at Clinton Correctional in Danamora. Uh Joyce Mitchell started her uh, employment with the uh, New York State entity known as Corecraft. Corecraft is the entity in New York State that makes furniture, license plates, road signs, uh, soap, as well as clothing, uniforms for uh, prison guards, as well as uh, the inmate population. Corecraft uh, uniform manufacturing that they do is a $50 million a year business. The labor is done by the inmate population that works for Corecraft. Uh, there's approximately 1,700 inmates that work for Corecraft in the different ventures that they have, and they're overseen and supervised by approximately 230 to 250 civilian workers. Joyce Mitchell was one of those workers, and her career with Corecraft started in March of 2008. 
Well, if it's a fifty million dollar a year business, these prisoners must be making a fortune in there working for this company, right? <laughs> well, understand your, your labor costs are, are minuscule, yeah. but the state looks at it with the uh, concept that they're teaching a uh, skill yeah. to the inmate population, uh, whether it be working the manufacturing of furniture, manufacturing soap, or the, the uh, tailor shops that, like that Clinton Correctional that are manufacturing uniforms. Uh, so they're te- the inmates are being taught a, um, a skill set. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, there's there's big money in it, without a doubt, mm-hmm. for the state, and it helps offset uh, costs of running the prisons and everything else. So, absolutely, the the state is looking at the uh, the bottom line, the returns. Yeah, there's a lot of money in all that, right? Like even uh, uh, the, the products, like the, the, the toothbrushes that the inmates use, and all these different type of because they have to be like uh, specially designed that they can't be turned into weapons, right? Uh, so all these companies, Correct. yeah. So all these companies that supply. Uh, material to the prisons they make a fortune absolutely it's specialized um goods uh like you said the, the toothbrushes are extremely short uh the premise behind that is there's not a lot to hang on to if you want to sharpen an end yeah. and the end of a toothbrush is easily sharpened because uh, the inmates are normally surrounded in, in concrete uh, stone and asphalt so there's plenty of surfaces to sharpen a toothbrush, uh, w- without a doubt. Um, so everything from a toothbrush to combs um, to ballpoint pens to pencils, everything is in a smaller version so that there's not a lot of length to it so that they can be uh, – that way they're not as easily uh, manufactured into contraband. And, and what about uh, – like? Other money's made off the inmates too, like the, their phone privileges. Like they pay a lot more for telephone calls than you and I would, right? Well, the um, phone privileges, of course, is held by a, uh, an outside carrier. Yeah, and New York State has nothing to do with that. So there are some charges, without a doubt, uh, for the inmates to make uh, calls from inside the prison out. Uh, there, there's absolutely uh, additional charges there, and. Um, it's like anything else, any other venture, uh, there's someone there at the other end of it making a lot of money because uh, there's a lot of people incarcerated. But on the same token, um, as, as expensive as it is to make a phone call, uh, the inmates also have what's known as a commissary inside the correctional right. facilities. Now, the commissary has everything from cigarettes to ice cream to Scooby snacks. And in the, our state, you'll find that those are at a greatly discounted price, uh, better than what you and I can buy them, uh, these different items for. And understand, um, this isn't just a, a low-quality food item. Um, I, I, I worked in the industry for a quarter of a century, and you would see Ben & Jerry's ice cream available, you would see Hershey chocolate products available. Uh, you would see the best of the best available at a highly discounted price. So, um, hey, wait, but is that unusual? Really... Is that unusual for New York State? Because I know over here in Nevada, when you want to send those gift packages and stuff like that, or add money to somebody's commissary, there's a fee on top. It's like seven dollars just to you know <laughs> get the process going. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> see, now in New York State, they're allowed two packages, yeah. thirty-five pounds a month. Um, there's absolutely no fee for the facility to accept those packages. Um, they're allowed 35 pounds of food items in the course of a month. Um, there are some restrictions with regards to color of clothing. If you want to send in some clothing items or something like that, but, um, no, there's, it, it's basically the total opposite than what you've got out there, well, that's good um, as well as the inmates can also order out. Um, from a number of different specialty catalogs that they receive. If they want to order their own new set of whitey tidies and um, tidy whiteys and, you know, <laughs> sneakers and T-shirts and sweats pants and whatevers, uh, they absolutely can order anything they want from uh, any vendor for that, for that matter, as long as it's been approved by the Department of Corrections. Uh, the only restrictions would be particular colors are not allowed. And the state doesn't want the inmates to be wearing the same colors that staff would be wearing. Um, so there, there's basically four colors that the inmates are not allowed uh, out of the uh, rainbow colors available. Gotcha. 
Okay, so back to Matt and, and Sweat. Uh, oh, boy. Okay, so now what happens now? These guys are sitting around there, and they come up to concoct this plan. I, I got to tell you, the, the whole uh, concept of prison breaks is pro- – everyone's fascinated by it. Everybody loves these kind of stories. They made so many movies about it, so many stories about it. Uh, so – but it, normally, though, there's always help from the inside for these guys to be able to get out, right? Well, in this particular case, there was help from the inside. Correct. And, and understand, with Denimora, uh Clinton Correctional, this facility had, uh, again, New York State's largest maximum security prison. They had not seen an escape in well over a century, well over 100 years. So this was not going to be an easy uh easy thing to do to escape from New York State's largest maximum security prison. However, with the assistance of Joyce Tilly Mitchell, uh, she was uh, found to be the, the weak link. Richard Matt and David Sweat were able to identify Joyce Mitchell as that weak link, and they simply worked her for everything that, that they could get out of her. Uh, and Joyce Mitchell was a willing participant in this escape. Richard Matt, master of manipulation. Previous to this escape from Clinton Correctional, he had four previous escapes. Two of those escapes were successful from other correctional facilities. David Sweat had no escape uh, history whatsoever. So if you got a guy that has had previous escapes, don't you keep a, a, a close eye on him? You absolutely would. Um, <laughs> Richard Matt, because of his escape history and because of his crimes, was on Clinton Correctional Facility Denimora's top 40 inmate list. He was, he was being monitored. Um, David Sweat, because of the high profile of his crime, killing a police officer, yeah. he too was on that high profile list, the top 40 list. Now, understand the top 40 list at Clinton Correctional that has nearly 3,000 inmates is actually approximately 75 names in length. So, but those two guys were, without a doubt, on the watch list. Um, but ironically, they were also in what was known as Clinton Correctionals or Denimora's honor block. They were in the, the housing unit that housed the so-called good inmates, uh, the honor block inmates are allowed additional privileges that the regular population doesn't get to enjoy. Gave them a little bit more ability to move around and to be out of their cells for longer periods of time. Uh, quite a strange concept when it comes right down to the correctional facility setting, that you would have a, a, a guy that was a cop killer in an honor block and the other guy who's done multiple state bids and has a couple of bodies to his credit um, he's in the honor block as well. It's kind of a kind of a strange concept, I guess, when you look at it. Yeah, habitual escape too. You you would think. Now, right. how, how did they pull that off? So, <clears throat> Richard Matt is the mastermind. Richard Matt is the master of manipulation. Richard Matt, as well as David Sweat, both were employed in the Corecraft Taylor Shop. Supervisor Joyce. Tilly Mitchell. Right off the bat, Joyce Mitchell would start showing different, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Different breaches in security. As simple as they may sound, Joyce Mitchell would bring in brownies and cookies and packaged candy, and she'd give that to the inmate. She'd be introducing contraband into the facility. Now, Nobody can get stabbed with a sheet pan full of brownies, and I have never heard of anybody losing an eye because of a you know a cookie that was flung from one side of the room to the other. And uh, I've actually never heard of anybody choking on hard candy that was you know in critical condition out of a correctional facility setting. So why is it considered contraband? And the concept is real simple: staff members that work inside correctional facilities are not allowed to bring in anything and give them to the inmates. It's a simple premise. And if you're going to be willing to bring in brownies and cookies and packaged candies, then one must ask the question, especially if you're an inmate, what else are you willing to do? And what else, what other rules are are not pertinent to you? And that's how this whole thing started. Joyce Mitchell, by simply bringing in brownies, cookies, and packaged candy, would later become the poster child for New York State for bringing in hacksaw blades and other escape paraphernalia. 
to two convicted killers. Fascinating. Well, let's take a little commercial break here. We're with uh, uh, Charles A. Gardner, former municipal court judge, uh, who spent his whole life in New York State Department of Corrections and knows knows the prison system, that's for sure, man. I haven't been able to catch him in a <laughs> slip of once. Uh, his website is charlesagardner.com, and the book, he's just written his book, Adanamora, Two Escape Killers, Three Weeks of Terror, and the Largest Manhunt Ever in New York State. Great storyteller, uh, Charles A. Gardner. Uh, so we were talking about how uh, Tilly there was bringing in these cupcakes and brownies and stuff like that. And so, yeah, once you start doing that, you know, what's to stop you from bringing in cell phones and drugs and, and like you said, hacksaw blades, right? Right, and that's exactly where this, this story goes. Um, the inmates, uh, Matt and Sweat, would continue to um, just ask Joyce Mitchell, a.k.a. Tilly, for different pieces of contraband. Uh, they'd put a little sugar coating on top of their notes that they would send her with regards to, um, you know, love you long time, looking forward to spending time with you, and all that other happy, you know what, nonsense. And Joyce Mitchell would uh, take a hook line and sink her. Uh, ultimately, Joyce Mitchell would introduce lighted glasses, lighted reading glasses into the facility um, as early as August of 2014 for less than $10. Those lighted glasses would be later utilized in the subterranean tunnels as the inmates had burrowed their way out of this facility. Uh, she would also bring in hacksaw blades um, and just as crazy as it sounds, hidden inside raw ground beef. And, um, and again, um, the inmates would take those and utilize those hacksaw blades to cut out of the back of their cells. Joyce Mitchell, uh, as early as October of 2014, would be bringing in and start bringing in over 70 containers of black and cayenne pepper with the premise that it could be utilized later during the escape once the inmates were outside of the confines of the, uh, the facility to throw off the tracking dogs. Mm. As well, she smuggled in uh, numerous uh, times uh, alcohol, Bacardi 151 uh, rum, wild turkey uh, bourbon. Uh, and it was just it was a never ending flow of contraband that this individual was bringing in. Yeah, when you watch TV, the average person thinks that all this contraband is getting into the jails and the prisons uh, through the inmates' anus, right? That's the big story out there. But uh, from oh, your, well. <laughs> from your, uh, some does, but from your experience, what, how's the majority? How are you getting in bottles of 151 and cell phones and all this kind of stuff? How's this stuff getting in there? Well, I mean, in, in this, this look at Joyce Mitchell. I mean, Joyce Mitchell was introducing this contraband. With regards to the alcohol, she would just simply take a, um, let's say, a Coca-Cola product or Pepsi product, something, you know, the dark-colored uh, colas. She would open that container, and she would pour out a certain amount of the cola, and she would add her Bacardi 151 or the bourbon and simply, you know, you know just, just add that and, and walk right through into the facility with it. Now, I understand New York State allows you to bring in um, so-called unsealed containers if you're a staff member uh, for the purpose of your lunches or breaks or whatever. And Joyce Mitchell was exploiting that uh, privilege uh, and thus bringing that, uh, you know, the alcohol in that way, pre-mixed with, with some sort of a cola. With regards to the hacksaw blades, Joyce Mitchell was simply concealing the hacksaw blades in the bottom of her tote that she was carrying in on a daily basis and at the very bottom it would be covered by whatever's and it would not be picked up now understand entering new york state's largest maximum security prison the traffic coming as well as going from that facility is controlled by a total of are you ready for this number ed one staff member. Wow. I, would, I was going to guess like six or seven, and that was going to be a... Right. Yeah. Right. So the next time you... Let, let's compare entering New York State's largest maximum security prison to... Let's go through the, the TSA checkpoint, mm. and let's utilize that comparison. So can you imagine the next time that you were to fly, if you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are going to be either coming or going to that particular checkpoint, that everything is going to be handled by... One person. How confident would you be with regards to how well everything has been checked? And, and this is what New York State has done. Is it's, a, it's a concept called do more with less. New York State has continued to cut back on staffing levels in their correctional facilities. And the, the, the job duty of the officer working 
the entrance to this facility as well as all facilities for New York State. It, all those tasks are being done by one individual. That they're tasked with checking the hundreds of people coming and going within a very tight time frame, keeping these facilities safe and contraband free. You and I both know, as well as your listeners know, that's an impossible task. Um, it's as simple as, again, comparing it to a TSA checkpoint, it will never work. But on paper, it looks wonderful. Now, understand that same staff member also has no breaks and they're in shift. So there's no mid-morning or mid-afternoon break, and there is no lunch hour for these staff members that work for the New York State Department of Corrections. New York State has these people working their entire shift with no designated lunch hour or breaks. If you get a break somehow, way, shape, or form, because no traffic coming through, I'm happy for you, but you're expected to eat on the fly. So thus, it adds to the stress and the potential for the missing of contraband. I mean, when you think about it, they could probably smuggle a damn Jeep in if they were crafty enough, or maybe smuggle one out. You know, when when this was on the news, it was on the news 24 uh, seven. Mm-hmm. I remember watching and the videos on YouTube, you can still see it. They showed uh, they were doing a live uh, uh, spot out in front of the, the prison. And this guy walks over to the wall, a rope comes down, he attaches his package to the rope, and they pull the rope up. Now, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> Did you see that? Yeah, well, if someone probably had gotten their lunch delivered. You know, somebody <laughs> probably ran and grabbed a, a sandwich for him, and that was going up into a wall tower. Because understand, those posts, those officers cannot leave those wall towers for anything. So everything that's done up in, upstairs in that wall tower during that officer's shift is done up there in that wall tower. That little, little probably 800 square foot, I don't know if it's even that big, probably 300 square foot, uh, surrounded by all windows. Everything that's done is in there. Um, you don't get to leave type of a scenario. So, yeah, what you saw was probably a lunch delivery, uh, truth be known. So he had a buddy that actually went out and got him a fresh sandwich. And or, or the delivery guy. Could have been the, back yeah. up. Could have been the yeah. delivery now, guy. Now, I understand yeah. also, and, and it's kind of funny that you brought this up, at the time of the escape, there's 12 wall towers that surround the perimeter. There's a 30-foot perimeter wall around Clinton Correctional. There's 12 wall towers that surround that facility. That's the way that that was engineered and designed by whoever, definitely somebody smarter than me, whoever designed that that prison said we need 12 of these wall towers and they put up those 12 different posts. At the time of the escape, half, half of those wall towers were not even manned. At the time of the escape, some of those wall towers had been mothballed for over two decades. Another cost-saving measure on behalf of New York State. Hmm. How'd that work out for them? So, but these guys, they chose, they had, they got through a, a like some kind of a drainage or sewage pipe. And do you believe that story? First of all, you think that's how they got out? Absolutely. And yeah. I've got all the documentation okay. to prove it actually. <laughs> but th- this, this story, this nonfiction yeah. has more twists and turns than you can shake a stick out. And, and they say sometimes nonfiction is stranger than fiction. If, you, if you're looking for a read with regards to a lonely, unhappy wife working in the largest maximum security prison, if you're looking for a read that talks about two dangerous convicted killers and a complacent correction officer, if you're looking for a read that talks about a three-way sex scandal with a Hollywood, California twist, well, we're talking about it. Because this has all of that. And then you top it off with a manhunt in an ancient, unforgiving wilderness known as the Adirondack Park. And then just for a little dessert at the end, we have finger-pointing politicians. Mm. The truth is stranger than fiction. And this nonfiction right, Denimora, has every bit of that in it. Now, now how big was that pipe that they shimmied through? And, And how far did they have to go to get out? So... Once they breached the back of their cells, long story short, the inmates, it took them 133 days from the time they started, from the time that they were, uh, the hacksaws were introduced into the facility to the time that they were outside of the perimeter wall. 133 days. Their subterranean struggles took them through the subterranean tunnels at Clinton Correctional in Denimora. Uh Once they breached the back of their cells, they, they wiggled their way down into the subterranean tunnels had a number of different um, 
walls or locations that they had to wiggle their way through. And long story short, they came to what was known as the, the heat pipe for the facility. Uh, during the winter, of course, the heat pipe is filled with steam. It's pressurized. It's, it's what's heating the entire facility. With the power plant, the, the heat generation plant would be located on the outside uh, of the facility. It made Matt, master manipulation, and the man that had four previous escapes, two successful, two unsuccessful, was smart enough to know that all utilities, whether they be heat, power, telephones, cable, everything came in under the wall. Nothing went up and over the wall. And he knew that if he was to follow that steam plant, that steam pipe back to uh, it's where it originated from, it would bring him back to the steam plant, which was located outside the perimeter wall. And they did just that. By late May or mid-May, the steam had been shut down. The heating season was over. So the inmates had come to the perimeter wall, they were starting to chip their way through the perimeter wall, and actually they made jokes about an American classic, Stephen King's Shawshank Redemption. And they were playing on the fact that it took Andy Dufresne and Shawshank 20 years to escape. And that at the rate they were going, they figured they were going to do it in half. They figured it was going to take them 10 years to chip through that 30-foot perimeter wall with the rude, crude tools that they had. Um, Once the steam was shut down, it was a game changer. They knew as easily as they'd cut out of their cells, they could cut into that pipe, Mm -hmm. wiggle their way down that pipe to get past the, uh, the base, the footings of the perimeter wall, cut back out of that pipe into the next subterranean tunnel to freedom. And that's just exactly what they did. And it would take down, they would be basically cutting 10 inches of pipe a night. And it didn't take them very long. They were able to breach into the pipe, wiggle their way into the pipe. It was approximately 18 inches um, in diameter. Um, And they were able to wiggle their way down the pipe and and wick their way uh, out of the facility and cut their way out. And and what was was the distance they had to wiggle in this 18-inch pipe? So... (laughs) There, were, there was a sleeve that the pipe was in through, as it went through the perimeter wall. And that sleeve, there was just enough daylight that they could see oh that God. it was approximately 10, 12 feet. So they were able to come up with a measuring stick that they had found in their subterranean tunnels. And they were able to figure out that approximate distance that they needed to exit the pipe. And they cut accordingly. Um, and as it was, they cut perfectly. They cut as soon as uh, the pipe had uh, breached the uh, perimeter wall. And uh, then they made their way out, um, and they were in the uh, subterranean tunnels that went down to the power plant, now, the now, heating plant. Tilly was supposed to be waiting for him when he got out. Was that the plan? That was the plan that Richard Matt had conspired with David Sweat as well as with Tilly. The three of them had conspired. Joyce Mitchell, Tilly, was, a, again, a willing participant. And she was going to be there at midnight at this four-way intersection that they could clearly see from the tailor shop windows. Wow. And they, they had decided that, you know, right there is where you're going to meet us. And understand, Joyce Mitchell, Tilly had gotten daily updates as to the progression of the escape. She knew when they breached the cells. She knew when they breached different obstacles and obstructions. And she was given a daily update as to, as to their progression, as to their midnight tour, their self-guided tour through the facility. And at any point in time, she could have stopped us. It was the final... Uh, going into the, you know, the weekend, the inmates told Joyce, hey, we breached it, we're out, the path is clear, tonight's the night. And they were expecting her to be there. And when they were there waiting, they looked and no Joyce Mitchell yet, but they were a few minutes early. And then finally, it was time to go. Midnight was the, the golden hour that she was supposed to be there, and then the inmates popped out of the manhole, and Joyce wasn't there. So then they went to plan B and they started their walk. And why did she chicken out? Do we know? Well, I think the reality check finally got her. Uh, I think uh, the reality that she was going to be climbing in uh, in her vehicle, her personal vehicle with uh, two convicted killers 
And her grocery list included make sure that when you show up, you bring a compass, a tent, sleeping bags, fishing poles, a hatchet, a rifle, a shotgun, ammunition, and hacksaw blades. Um, I think finally after 133 days of whatever, she, uh, I, I guess the reality finally struck her that, hey, it was it was zero hour. And she got cold feet. Uh, the, there was a plot to kill her husband. I, I don't know if that was the final straw that she didn't have uh, enough guts to go through it. I have no idea uh, what she was thinking. Hard to tell how that head screwed on there, what she was thinking. Uh, for the years of contraband that she had introduced into that facility, how do you even begin to figure out what she was thinking? Now, uh, she's in prison now, right? It's only been five years. Right. She's she's in prison now. She's currently serving time at um, uh, Bedford Hills, which is New York State's maximum security for female inmates. Um, I actually worked in Bedford Hills as a, uh, as a lieutenant, um, as I was working my way back up north. So that's where Joyce is now, down uh, in Westchester County, down by the city, New York City. And how much time does she get? Uh, she was given uh, a sentence of two and change up to seven and change. Okay. And chances are she'll probably serve most of it because of the embarrassment that uh, she created for the governor's office and for the state of New York. Chances are she probably won't parole as early as a lot of them. Um, but there's no guarantees there either because New York State has been doing some really crazy things with its parole department. Uh, they're letting out convicted murderers every week. Uh, so what the hell's letting Joyce Mitchell out? That isn't going to be, you know, any big deal. They've been letting people out of jail um, like crazy lately. So. And, and Matt and Sweat, sweat how to, what is, can you describe their demise? What happened to well, these guys? Matt, Matt didn't fare very well. Long story short, uh, he conf- he was confronted by a Bortec team, federal agents. Um, he banished a um, 20 gauge shotgun, uh, started pointing it around at uh, law enforcement, and uh, his uh, his fate was pretty gruesome. Um, Sweat had separated from Matt just days, just barely days earlier, uh, and he had changed direction as to where they were originally heading, and he uh, was shot. Uh, by a New York State uh, trooper, a sergeant with a New York State police. The sergeant was on patrol by himself. Uh, he observed um, Sweat running through an alfalfa meadow and uh, confronted him, foot pursuit, and succeeded upon uh, uh, capturing Sweat after firing his service revolver twice and striking Sweat. And uh, it, weren't they hit out one time at, at, like at a hunting shack that was also owned by a corrections officer? Was that just a coincidence? Correct. Now, understand, <clears throat> Matt and Sweat, once they breached the facility, Joyce Mitchell wasn't there. Um, they did not have a, a plan B. They didn't have a, a, a backup plan. Hmm. Uh, Joyce Mitchell had come through with them for everything they had ever asked for. She had done uh, sexual favors to introduction of contraband and alcohol and escape paraphernalia. Jesus, you'd have thought she'd have shown up for the simple ride. Um, But lo and behold, she didn't. So as the inmates um, made their way through the foothills of the Adirondacks, what they would do is they would burglarize seasonal hunting camps uh, in the early spring of 2015, uh, taking only enough to survive for food and beverage uh, and leaving no telltale signs that they were there. Ironically, this being Matt's last escape, escape number five, it would be truly uh, quite reflective of his first escape, whereas a youth, he had escaped from a detention center in western New York, and he actually burglarized seasonal camps for, again, food and beverage. Ah. So Matt's last escape was indicative of his first. Um, But they made their way through a number of different camps, some owned by correction officers. Uh, And understand the biggest employer up in northern New York is the New York State Department of Corrections. Um, Some were owned by retired troopers. Um, And the one particular um, camp that you're talking about was where they were discovered some two weeks into the escape. a off-duty correction officer was making his way um, up to his camp. Um, camp was known as Twisted Horn, approximately three miles from the 
I guess we can try to call it a road, um, a two lane dirt path that's probably more realistic. Um, he, some three miles up off the two lane dirt path would be Camp Twisted Horn. And again, this off duty correction officer was making his way up there on his 600 plus pound ATV. As he approached camp, his lab alerted and ran to the camp and was growling and the hair was standing up on the back of the dog's neck. And so the off-duty correction officer by the name of John Stockwell, a friend of mine, Stumpy is what we call him, um, challenged um, whoever was inside the camp after he had observed movement inside the bunkhouse. So he drew a handgun that he had had with him and challenged whoever's in there and they need to come out, show themselves. And again, this off-duty correction officer was by himself, and his approaching the camp was well announced by the noise of that 600-pound ATV. Uh, the two inmates that were inside chose not to confront Stumpy, and instead they ran out. They ran out the back doors. So this is probably one of the most exciting parts of the book as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> John Stockwell, a.k.a. Stumpy, jumps back on his four-wheel drive ATV and starts racing back towards civilization. Now, he probably goes like hell for a few seconds, and then he realizes, oh, my gosh, <laughs> I've forgotten Dolly. So he stops, and he yells, Dolly! And Dolly comes trotting back. Now he's got his dog, and, and he continues down towards his four-wheel drive pickup truck and back to the landing where he had unloaded the four-wheeler. But he had to go at a pace that Dolly could keep up. And he had approximately a mile and a half of uh, distance to cover. When he finally got to his truck, he threw Dolly in the truck, abandoned his four-wheeler, jumped in his truck, and started heading down towards civilization, down what was known as the Wolf Pond Road. He looked in his mirror, and oh, nuts! He had never disconnected the ramps that he had utilized to unload the ATV from his truck. So once again, he had to stop, take the time to disconnect the ramps, threw them off to the side, abandoned those on the camp road, and then made his way towards civilization. Approximately a mile down the road, he ran into a group of ATV riders. He explained to them what he had just encountered, and up in northern New York and in the foothills of the Adirondacks, we have commonly what we refer to as the cell phone dance, mm -hmm. where everyone stands with their cell phones above their heads, <laughs> hoping to get something that's yeah. resembling a signal so they can actually make a call out. And to no avail, no one was able to get a call out. So John Stumpy Stockwell continued down the road just a short distance until he finally had a signal. John calls 911, identifies himself. Of course, they've got his phone number. Says that he's just had an encounter at Twisted Horn. Gives the location as to where Twisted Horn is located up off the Wolf Pond Road in Franklin County. And he starts to explain in detail as to what had happened. And as quick as the phone call had started with 911, it stopped. Oh, no. 911 repeatedly contacted and tried to call back John Stockwell to no avail. They were unable to reach John Stockwell. So they called John Stockwell's residence where his wife answered the phone. They explained, this is 911. We've just had a conversation with John Stockwell. He told us that he's had an encounter. He told us he was at camp. We've tried to reconnect with him, and we cannot. Can you give us more details as to where we can possibly find him? And John Stockwell's wife methodically went through the process of explaining to how to find Camp Twisted Horn on this little two-lane dirt path called a road, the Wolf Pond Road. And what happens with John Stockwell? You'll have to read the book, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but people got to know what it's like up there. Because like I said, my friends had a cabin, and it was like, well, you, there's, a, there's a duck on, on a tree. <laughs> That's where the road is. Yeah. Turn there. And, uh, and then they're, oh, they're yeah. terrified. They tell me, if, if you see bears, you know, don't, don't sleep in your car if you get lost. All this kind of crazy stuff. Hey, no, Oh, real... absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's the four-legged furries that are running through there are the black bears. We have moose. We have white-tailed deer. We have a, quite an assortment of four-legged furries. Absolutely. How accurate do you think the Showtime uh, series was? The Showtime got the location correct. And the, <laughs> that, that was it. Okay. Um, you know, and, and giving Mr. Stiller his due, um, his artistic uh, flair, as far as I was concerned, he was trying to um, 
uh, parallel Shawshank because Shawshank's such an American classic. Shawshank's been around for a long time, and it's going to be around for a lot longer. Um, and yeah. that's what he did, uh, as far as I'm concerned. The inaccuracies in Escape from Denimora, um are huge. Um, he took a lot of liberties. Um, he, he he disappointed a lot of people. Hmm. Needless to say, um, if. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that because they saw it on TV, it, it's got to be true. You know, if I read it on the Internet, it's got to be true. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, they, they think that's the reality of it. And and it was be, the reason why I wrote Denimora was because the media had it so far off. Being a local resident that I was, I've lived up there for 60 years, spending a quarter of a century in the prison system, there's not much about the northern New York, the Adirondacks, that you can tell me, I've lived there. Um, this story unraveled and unfolded in my front yard and it ended up in my backyard mm. when it was all said and done. And it was about an industry that I had spent a quarter of a century in and had just recently retired from. So I had no axe to grind. I have no agenda. And I have no spin. We wrote the book, Danamora, for one simple reason and one simple reason only, to just give you the truth. And as I've said earlier, Nonfiction sometimes is stranger than fiction, and this has got all of it. I'll tell you. We only got a couple of minutes left, and, and I want to give you a chance to just leave with, with your final thoughts. Uh, but before that, uh, is it possible that these are the only three people that knew about the planning of this escape? Sweat, Matt, and Tilly are the only three that, that were involved in this? Well, understand, um, and again, it's in the book. Yeah, the inmates that lived next door to Matt and Sweat had They heard the cutting. They, yeah. they heard the cutting noises, um, and they questioned the cutting noises. And ironically, the inmate who lived next door to Matt, uh, he had a great day the day before the escape. Uh, he got a brand new color TV from Richard Matt. Yeah. He got all sorts of bowls of food later on that night from from Matt and Sweat. Um, it's an amazing thing that he slept really well that night and heard nobody leaving. I mean, nobody moving around. I mean, he heard nothing. <laughs> um, ironically, there's no doubt in my mind that the inmate population knew. And the reason why I say that is that one of the first opening chapters that we talk about is the inmates had had a major disturbance just weeks prior to this escape. Inmates, because they're incarcerated, please understand, these are not stupid people just because they're incarcerated and because they're inmates. They're extremely smart, these guys. And they knew that, well, we got a couple of guys that might be leaving, but unfortunately the rest of us are here to stay. And they know that in the maximum security setting, if they are to give anybody up, if they are to rat somebody out, that's a good way to end up with some iron in your diet. And the iron usually bleeds, if you know what I'm saying, in your diet. So they're not going to just go rat somebody out because they think they're getting ready to escape. But what they're going to do is they're going to save face. And normally, if you have a major disturbance in a maximum security prison, within a day, if that long, there's a lockdown and the facility is frisked. It's searched. They had a major disturbance prior to this escape, just a few days prior, and the inmates would figure that we're about to be locked down. The administration of that facility at Denimora asked to lock down the facility and search the facility. And the bureaucrats in Albany said, no, it's going to cost us money. That's expensive. It's inconvenient. Cowboy up and run your jail. And a few days later, New York State taxpayers were on the hook for a million dollars a day, mm. and we were looking at the largest manhunt in state's history. Charles Gardner, what do you want to leave us with? Denimora is available <laughs> wherever books are sold. Go to my website, charlesagardner.com, and I'm proud to announce that uh, we're number one bestseller with Amazon Kindle version for the last uh, week or so uh, in four different categories. Uh, three of the four were biographies of uh, Murder Mayhem, uh, biographies of law enforcement, as well as uh, criminology. So, and keep an eye uh, out to it's, the... a, it's, it's a good read. It's a five star rating right now on Amazon. Yeah, there's like Denimora 56 reviews. A, a ton of reviews, to all, all positive reviews. And there's going to be some book signings in Lake Placid in May, in June in uh, New Jersey, and in July in New York City. Uh, Charles Gardner, thank you so much. Ed, thank you. Have a wonderful day. You too. Good night. 
And now a word from our sponsors. OppermanReport.com. Hey, do you like what you're hearing? Do you like the work that you see us doing here at Opperman Report? You can support that work by becoming a member at OppermanReport.com. And as you have access to over 200 exclusive shows and interviews that you can't find on YouTube or Spreaker or iHeart or iTunes or KYAH, you can't find them anywhere else online, exclusive to our member sections, to our members. Also, too, there's images, videos, documents, court docs. And don't forget, you can hear your ad played here on the Opera and Report. Reach hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people on a daily basis because the show is repeated every day all over the world. Contact me at operandreport at gmail.com and I'll give you a good deal on on advertising rates. Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile cart or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at one 877 986-7771 and get your sales rolling. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at Aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. You call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. Are you ready to change your life but don't know how to start? Is your stress and worries keeping you awake at night? Have you been battling grief, anxiety, or depression all alone? Have you lost touch with your own sense of being or spirituality? Soul Free Therapies offers professional and affordable live video streaming counseling and coaching services from the comfort of your own home. Sessions offered in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Go to our website at www.soul-free.com and book your first session today. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I've dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. PureSoapFlakes.com 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. 
they have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opera Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to send a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. <laughs> 